All right. Well, welcome to uh, our international reporting talk. And we're uh, really happy so many people are interested in international reporting because we weren't sure if we'd have um, one other person or we would talk to each other or have some somewhat more people. Um, we thought the way we would go about this is to, uh, first of all, ask you a bit and you can put this in the chat or just raise your hand and, and, um, and uh, then we'll, we'll go through, but get a sense of what you think of as international reporting, what that, what your image of it is. So we kind of understand what your what, what intrigues you about it. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about different ways to approach it um, institutionally as a freelancer, something a bit in between. And then we were gonna ask each other a couple of questions and then we're, we're all yours for your questions. And hopefully none of this will take too long. We'll have lots of time for questions. So uh, first of all, I'm curious what, what uh, we're both really curious, what you think of as international reporting and what interests you about it um, in, in any, and this is very informal. If you're more comfortable putting it in the chat, fine. If you want to say something, yeah. that's wonderful. You, not to interrupt Alyssa, please feel free to unmute yourself and remain unmuted. Feel yeah. also free to turn the video on so we know who we are talking to. And uh, we'd like to keep it freewheeling, starting with uh, how do you perceive foreign correspondence? Also it's, muted. There you go, Vanessa, now you're unmuted. Just go uh, ahead. Sorry. Um, just my thoughts on what international journalism are. Yeah, for what, for when you're interested in this, what, what you're thinking of as international, being an international correspondent or... You know, I think of it a lot as not every country or every people have as robust journalism as the United States or as like other countries. And so I think of it as a really good opportunity to help share stories with the world that I, I, I guess that's just what journalism is overall, but just share stories with the world that otherwise wouldn't gain international attention that they need, um, which can also just, you know, help fix problems. So that's kind of how I look at it. Um, okay. That's great. <laughs> Anyone else have any other? Megan was saying something. So I think like I took a class last semester where we were focusing on like transitional justice and like human rights, um, kind of a comparative politics class. And I found like, you know, it kind of international reporting on those issues, like really illuminating and helpful to me. And um, I think it was just like a great window into seeing kind of the culture of different places that wouldn't even, um, you obviously wouldn't see otherwise. And I think just from academically, it really opened my worldview a lot. So I really enjoyed that. Yeah, it does. It does open your eyes to the world in ways uh, other beats, all beats do, but my favorite is foreign reporting. Anyone, anyone else wants to? I can go. No one else. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I actually am interested in international reporting and I got interested in journalism through um, learning about um, foreign affairs and specifically Syria. So when I think of international reporting, I think of foreign correspondence in Syria, which um, I entered college hoping to, aspiring to be um, similar and do similar work in human rights. Um, so a lot of what I think about in international reporting is kind of human rights based, who's um, bringing the on the ground stories um, from different communities and a lot of like local reporters, um, local journalists in different areas and different countries um, who have done that at like great personal risk. Um, because I focus on human rights, a lot of the instances that come to mind are rather intense, not saying that's all of what it is, but that's a lot of what I think about, um, like Al Jazeera and BBC and other organizations like that. All right. I guess the first, I, uh, I, I guess the first thing I have to say is, if you have to be a foreign correspondent, you can't be shy. Uh, <laughs> you, you have to uh, put your opinion out there. And uh, starting with, uh, I would say now, um, from what Vanessa says, it is, it is. Uh, I, I, of course, uh, Alyssa has a completely uh, different experience and point of view of approaching this beat. 
and I am very new to it myself. I'm like four years into foreign correspondence and I agree to everything that all three of you said. This beat uh, shows this amongst the basic thing is this beat shows you your own blind spots of how little you know on a daily basis. And the more okay you are being uncomfortable by that unsettling of finding out something or being in this kind of place, the more you'll see that uh, you your intuitions and temperament will lend yourself to exploring a story you know nothing about. Uh, I'm gonna let, uh, it, uh, we will, I promise you get more specific as your questions get more specific. I will let Alyssa take over. So I, I was just gonna say there, there sort of are a few different routes to become, becoming a foreign correspondent. And I, I wanted to respond in a way to some of what you're saying, because several of you are really interested in human rights and in uh, transitional justice would be another aspect of it. And there are many ways that one can immerse yourself in that kind of um, um, that kind of work and knowledge. And being a foreign cor correspondent involves that, but it involves a lot of other things too that um, that don't always. Um, leave you feeling solidly on uh, on morally, you know, talking to the people who you believe most need to be heard, because you also have to give voice to the people who you might um, not think much of, the, the rulers and leaders who are perpetrating um, what you might think are atrocities and they might think are how you keep control of a country. And so part of the, uh, of the challenge is, um, deciding how you want to get at uh, looking at faraway parts of the world that are not well understood, um, particularly in the West, um, and trying to get inside that point of view. And it's something um, Vidya has has spent all of her time doing, and she um, is too modest when she says she's just um, doing it for the last four years. Um, so one way that the basic ways you do this is you can go as a freelancer. Vidya is a freelancer and she has done the very hard and courageous thing of going without an organization's support into places that are far from where she lives in India, um, where there are terribly um, difficult situations, refugee situations, conflict, and reporting on that for people who um, then pay her by the piece. It's extremely difficult to both find people who will do that and then get them to actually pay you so you can survive. But um, people do very independent work and really some of the best work is done that way. Then there's institutional work where you go and work for an organization like a like a CNN, like a NPR, the New York Times, whatever, BBC, someone mentioned, Al Jazeera. And you're posted there and you have some institutional framework. Um, another way is that you work for whatever organization you work for, but you find or they find a foreign story that needs reporting and is meaningful to your community. So... For instance, during a war like the war in Iraq, many, many local papers and local radio and TV stations would send a correspondent with the troops who were there from their area. And they often came back with really very interesting stories. Um, and that's a way to kind of um, sort of dip your toe in without, you know, and seeing if you really like it. It's very different from working in America. Um, and going home to a home. The other kind, it's not just wars you would do it with. Let's take a, like a, a, a Vietnamese community in um, somewhere on the West Coast in say, say south of San Francisco you, or an Afghan community. There might be a, a disaster, an earthquake, a tsunami, and you might go for a one-time one um, reporting uh, task. So, so there are many ways to get overseas and um, to to take a look at, um, uh, at at what's happening and try to see the world through the eyes of people who are who don't live or ha and certainly don't live in the United States, but also really have a different point of view on almost everything um, in life, um, religion, um, justice, um, 
and and a sense of of poverty and wealth that's dramatically different. Um, so I just wanted to lay that out, and um, now I'll let um, Vidya say a little bit more. Uh, uh, but I I started freelancing in twenty seventeen, and it is the it is as different from institutional foreign reporting. So as against New York Times, uh, I think Vanessa said that American newsrooms are the most powerful. So they actually are among the few who send out reporters into conflict zones or proximal to conflict zones with hostile environment training, with insurance. But increasingly, uh, especially in my part of the world, uh, India is now an authoritarian government. That's actually why I started freelancing, because how the government uh, works is through media and honest media, uh, honest journalists were elbowed out of Indian newsrooms consistently. And I suddenly found myself to be a freelancer when the Rohingya genocide began in uh, August 2017. And uh, how freelancers work is you whatever little I, I at that point I sold my car because I needed money for tickets and then I needed the biggest expenses transport because you need cars to get you to refugee camps or wherever you're heading and then translators and then there is a whole uh, team that you have to put together uh, how this essentially works my initial years were mostly me dipping into my own pocket and selling whatever I could but then when I do go in, I now have a cheat sheet. If you ever want to be a freelancer, get in touch with me. The surest thing to do is uh, be meticulous with your pitches, but always, uh, uh, so aim for, I always send out three to five pitches. And a good trick is to, within say the three stories that I write for the Atlantic and the LA Times in the US, but I also write for publications in Europe and I do write in South Asia as well. Uh, it, almost always I have three pitches and almost always the third pitch is my favorite one. So I, I give the editor a couple of pitches to say no to so that by the time they come to the third one, they feel like they've rejected two and they give you one. So as a freelancer, keeping faith with uh, uh, just consistently pitching is the trick. But I have to flag that most of 90% of foreign correspondence is just boring stuff. Your car breaks down and your batteries run out while you're on your way. I've lost my credit card and then my debit card on the same day in Bangladesh and then you're out of money. So a lot of this kind of stuff that happens and you're a freelancer and by yourself, and you don't have an address to have the replacement card sent to. <laughs> yeah, and all of these things intrinsically depends on how well networked you are and how well planned you are before you go in and how well researched you are in the local culture. Uh, so a lot of work is done long before you set foot uh, uh, or your boots are on the ground. And I cannot insist uh, this... Uh, a, before I was even capable of doing semi subpar reporting on the genocide, I had to go read the colonial history, the history of the empire, then the history of how Burma became in, different from India and then became Myanmar and then Myanmar became the oppressor in the Rohingya tragedy. So, and I'm sure uh, Alyssa will agree with the, uh, uh, having the social context because also your not in a country that you understand. And in, in Bangladesh, I'm an outsider and there are some ethics involved in what I can say and cannot. And to know all of that long before you get in uh, pri primes you for success is what I feel. I want to toss it back to Alyssa with a question that I have not been able to ask her in my whole Neiman year because you never had an opportunity to do this. Uh, I'm not sure if you Googled or read her piece uh, for which he won the Pulitzer, which was called uh, How Baida Wanted to Die. It was about, uh, a, she, it was a story of a female suicide bomber. And one of the things I admire Alyssa's uh, just presence for is that we now finally have female foreign correspondents who are telling stories of war that are female. And I'd like Alyssa to talk about how conscious it is, how difficult it is, what are the challenges, uh, especially in legacy media newsrooms like the New York Times? 
Sure, I'm glad to talk about that. Actually, I, I won the Pulitzer for a different story, but I won a different prize for that story. But it's one of my favorite stories. Um, uh, I, I guess one thing I should say is, first of all, I want to second what uh, Vidya said about um, really when you go abroad, one of the great privileges is that you, you spend a little time being a historian and a little time being a cultural anthropologist and a little time trying to understand the economics of the place because um, part of what uh, part of what matters anywhere you go, and that would be true if you're living in um, Arkansas and you went to report in in Oregon, is you you need to know the culture and the the local idiom and what drives the economy. And you part of being uh, overseas is that that is that much more alien to you. So it takes longer and. It's a way of showing respect for people, even if you don't know it when you arrive, because you certainly know a tiny percentage of what you will know, hopefully, when you leave. But you can ask people, and people want to explain their world to you. They are, they are very concerned that you don't understand their world. And so it's, it's an incredible um, privilege to be able to do what we rarely do here, which is to listen to different points of view on a place which you're seeing for the first time. Um, so the story that um, Vidya is talking about is um, I, I worked on in 2008 and 2009 when uh, I don't, uh, you would have been very young, but it would have been Jerry, it was uh, during the war in Iraq, there was a very large American presence. Um, it was a sort of second stage of the war. And the then it was an Al-Qaeda affiliate that was active. And they were kind of running out of suicide bombers. And suicide bombers, if you are in um, what is known as asymmetric warfare, meaning that you're, you don't have an army, so, but you're fighting in organized state, suicide bombers are very effective, um, particularly well-trained ones. Um, and I began to notice that women were doing this. And women were even um, more uh, effective for another reason, which is that in, in the local culture, they wear abayas, which are large, voluminous, um, often black, um, though not always, um, garments that go down to the floor. So you can hide a bomb underneath and you might, you might not even show it all, or you might look maybe just pregnant or um, fat or whatever. So you, you're a very good possible uh, infiltrator into, into a space that where there might be soldiers, Americans or Iraqis who are on the side of the government, which you oppose. And so as I began to see more and more women showing up in these reports of, of bombings, I wanted to know why they were doing it, whether they were being forced. That was the that was what Americans said, um, American military, they were being forced to do it, um, whether they were believed in what they were doing, whether they were very impoverished doing it for money. I, I just wanted to understand it. And so I asked myself how I could do that. I couldn't go interview them, I didn't think, because they were dead, right? So what are you gonna, you know, you can't talk to them. Um, their families would never talk to you because they were ashamed. And they, anyway, they came from very, very dangerous areas. So I began to look for women suicide bombers who had failed to uh, detonate their, their vests. And, um, and I actually found several. And then I went to the police who had them in custody and asked if I could interview them in jail. Um, and I think had a man done that, it would have um, um, violated a lot of cultural um, sort of prohibitions on men, a, a man, particularly a Western man, being with a woman in an enclosed space in a place where um, there would there would be worries. There was something sexual about it. There would be worries about possibly a man being. Um, um, if it was the wrong person, maybe in some way an agent, if you had a local reporter doing it, um, perhaps trying to give her something. Um, but coming as a, as a woman who was dressed 
um, in an abaya in a proper local dress. Um, I was I was given permission, and I spent hours and hours with her, learning about her life and interviewing her in jail. And then she was subsequently sent to a, an insane asylum. Um, and it was during the time at the insane asylum uh, where she managed to get a hold of the cell phone, and that it, it became sort of clear to me that she was somewhat interested in organizing my um, death um, and and that she certainly had the contacts to do that uh, because she was very connected to the Al-Qaeda world. But in the process, what I learned about her and the other woman I interviewed who was younger and a, a bit more lost was they had lost people. They had lost brothers, fathers. They were almost alone in in a world where women have no place alone. Women have no place without their family. And so they had been very well selected by uh, Al-Qaeda recruiters for the job of being suicide bombers. What did they have to live for? Here they would be famous. They would go to heaven. They would be celebrated. They were taken and trained in cells. They were made to feel very special. And so, although we think of it as suicide in ending your life, for them, that was, they were having this moment of, of specialness that they'd never had. They hadn't been treated very well, either of them, um, once their fathers and protective brothers died. Um, one of them, Beida, the one I spent the most time with, she, she had worked in a bomb factory, small bomb factory that her family had. Um, and I say that in a very matter of fact way, because if you came from her village, from her, um, from her family group, um, where you'd been besieged by the Americans, um, where houses had been bombed and destroyed, it was a very natural thing to do. It was a way to protest what was going on, just as we might see a protest today. It would be there, it was their form of protest. And the fact that it didn't work or that it wasn't going to work in the long run, because they were out, you know, that was they were outnumbered, really didn't matter because in their small world it might work and give them at least a temporary sense of making a difference to their and and retaining some honor for their, their um, village, their tribe. Um, and it took me a long time to understand that, but I, at the end of it all, I quite, I was quite sympathetic. Although of course, it, it's a very dangerous picture if someone reaches that point because they have nothing left to lose. And when you have nothing to lose, you do things that can hurt other people. So, so that's a little bit about that story, and I'm happy to answer more questions about it, but I don't want to get bogged, bogged down too much in it. Um, I was just going to spend a couple minutes asking Vidya a question about how she has approached refugee camps, because I, I just want to say it's, it's actually much more complicated than it looks, because when you, what you see on TV when you go to a refugee, when you, you know, see CNN or BBC, is a whole lot of people who look like they're just waiting to be interviewed. <laughs> and what it takes to get there, what it takes to get in, what it takes in terms so you don't get sick from the many, many diseases that are there, how you interact with people who are hoping you will have medicine or food for them, that's very complicated. So I think if you could Tell us, Vidya, a little bit about that experience of, of first going into the Rohingya camps. That would be great. And then we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, um, you, I, I, I could not have said this better. The refugee camps are not meant to make sense. Uh, they, this one in particular, the one in Bangladesh, came up almost overnight. Like the violence began in uh, Rakhine on 26th of August, I remember. By 27th and 28th, uh, the foreign correspondents from South, uh, a lot of uh, South Asian reporting happens either out of Delhi or Mumbai, and they fly in reporters and people are still trying to get to Bangladesh. And once you do get there, um, it's just chaos because the initial days, the UN did not know where to go. No one had information. And 
what I have learned now after going there repeatedly every year is that you are not expected to make sense while you're there. Uh, it takes a while to learn this. There are two kinds of reporters who come in knowing what their story is and then chasing that story, which is good if you have a good team and you've done your research and you know what you're looking for. So you're going in and getting exactly what you want. But most of the time that fails because once you get there, everything changes almost always in every assignment that I've gone in, knowing the story, it's challenged and it's changed it. So what I now do is I go and stay there for a long time. And I and all of these are privileges from having the time and being a freelancer to spend, say, a month in uh, Cox's Bazaar, which is where the camps are. And just spending, the only way to know the story is to actually embed yourself in their lives as against going in for like, half an hour and then telling the interviewee who's in the middle of her day, uh, has a bunch of things to do, has to go queue up for medicines and all sorts of things. You can't be like, oh, the camps will shut and I have to head back to the city. So answer my questions. You just have to turn up endlessly, not expecting anything day after day after day. And you, the story just comes to you if you're patient enough with yourself is what I would say. Having said that, it almost always helps keeping track of local newspapers, um, identifying local bylines that you, that speak to the kind of journalism that you want to do. And then of course, reading, reading the social or cultural context. Um, I'm, I, I'm just a little annoyed by the radio silence from all of you. So I'm gonna ask you guys to unmute at this point and throw questions at us so we can help you more in in a more targeted way uh well uh, i suppose just like one question i had was like what was like the hardest part of kind of going into that segment of the field for you or something just really unexpected that came up while you were trying to go in um is this for Alyssa or both of us both of you just both. you uh, start you start with yeah what has been the most unexpected it's frankly, I went in, we all go into these things with our own dysfunction and we bring our personal dysfunction to the story. So I went into the, the, the genocide was happening when a lot was going on in my personal life and in trying to escape it, I went there and I, it took me a while to realize how unkind I was in my early years of reporting in trying to I was a glory hound. That's what I was doing. I wanted my byline with like fancy newspapers and powerful newsrooms. And what I consistently was then doing was telling stories that I wanted to tell as against the stories that were actually happening in the lives of the people that I ostensibly was there. Like I, I, I uh, it was hard to face the fact that I was making this about my virtue of like going to Bangladesh and being with the wretched and reporting to the world when all that showed me was how it, it was just being fed by my own uh, ethical issues. And foreign correspondence is always something because there is race, there is culture, there is gender, there is politics, and then there is uh, war. So you need to be more sure-footed than I was, everything I did in the first couple of years was reckless bravado, and I would not recommend it. Um, maybe we take Claire's question and then we'll, I can try to feel whatever the next question is. Well, mine kind of ties in, so I hope that helps, but sure. Um, I, I wanted to know if you have any advice or things that you wish people had told you before you started in this field, which is so intense. Like already we've talked about genocide and suicide bombing and as students who really hope sure. to positively contribute to this field and go into this work, um, just as you were saying with, um, you know, mindfulness for the people who are really being impacted in the most horrific ways by what we hope to report on, how can we possibly prepare ourselves, one? <laughs> and um, is there anything you wish someone had told you as you started? 
Well, I think, you know, I, I don't want to make it sound um, so um, scarily unmoored because I think it's really important to remember that from far away, it looks very uh, disorganized and like um, sort of terrible situations. But for instance, in a refugee situation, and you have to think about everything as if, I would say, I think about everything as if it's a play, like a theater play. And you, you arrive there and you're arriving in the middle of a scene. So you have to take stock of who's there. Well, as Vidya pointed out, the UN may not know what's going on, but there are probably some UN people there. And then there are probably some uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders people there. And then there are probably some local uh, NGOs that work with um, people. I'm, this is a refugee camp, but you can take this for any any number of things. A tsunami would be, I guess you'd have refugees as well. Um, you would have, um, you know, immigrant situations. There are always going to be um, non-governmental structures that are there that you can tap into. And what takes a bit of time and that you end up, uh, but you might, it's very important to do is to come up with your network of people who you trust. And some of them might be, that you might disagree with me about this, but they might be government um, officials from your government or another government. Um, there might be, you might think most of them don't know very much or aren't very good, but then you find one who really does have an idea or they know what that government is trying to do. For instance, um, uh, Scandinavian governments are very often involved in refugee work. So you usually can find the Swedish committee there doing something. <coughs> they will have been there for years before you ever got there. The Swedish committee was in Afghanistan working on development for many years. People who do that are, are very helpful. The international care, there's all kinds of these organizations who have a lot of knowledge locally so that it's not, um, you're not completely dropped into space. Um, but that said, you still have to figure out, as Vidya said, what is the story? And there's always gonna be a superficial story, which is what TV will cover quickly or um, a newspaper that doesn't have much time or even a newspaper like mine, the New York Times, where um, we have to get, we have to immediately report. So we're going to say something very superficial in our first story, not enough food or, you know, um, uh, children are dying or doctor, no doctors available, whatever it is. It's going to be very simple minded and it's going to lay out one, one thing. But then gradually, you're going to create a body of knowledge, and you're going to create that in your for your readers. Because the, what's difficult, though, is to do that in a way that has the voices of the people on the ground, but also the context which they're thrown up against, which, as Vidya pointed out, it can be a very racist context. The Bangladeshis may not have wanted the Rohingyas there but they agreed to take them because of international pressure. I, that certainly is the case, um, for instance, uh, with many of the Syrian refugees um, all through, all through um, the, the Middle East. Um, it, it was the case years ago with Palestinian refugees. So, so you need to, to think both in depth about individuals and, and sort of vertically and uh, about the context in, which they're, which they're up against. Yeah. And I guess that would be, that would be part of, part of my answer. Um, I, I, I agree with everything Alyssa says, and I will add just one, I just want to share what I do before I know I'm going into a new story. I have this thing about, a, I, I like a very varied diet of uh, uh, how I consume my information and I am an information junkie. So if say I'm going into Bangladesh, I will read a book about it, read a podcast about it, watch a documentary about it, uh, go into some NGO report about it, speak to lawyers, activists, just long before I'm there, 
uh, this body of knowledge that Alyssa mentioned that you have to create and then feed it to your readers. Uh, I am perennially worried that it may be covered with my blind spots. In my country, I'm a Brahmin and upper caste, and those are blind spots Then I take into the other former, like post-colonial nations have its own system of hierarchy in social order. So uh, have a very varied diet. And between those six, seven things, you keep learning new things from very different vantages, and it helps you more. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you so much for taking questions. Um, I'm curious if you guys could talk a little bit about some of the pathways into international reporting, um, and maybe kind of give an idea of like, I mean, I, I know it, I'm sure it varies, um, and it really is probably person-based, but would you be willing to just share a little bit of your perspective, both of you guys, on how somebody might break into this field? Do you want to go first, Alyssa? No, you want to go first, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I started as a city reporter. But at the end, at the end of it, uh, foreign reporting is about uh, at its base injustice. Some uh, the whole the overarching, uh, if it's a theater, the overarching story may be about conflict, but at its core is this and to to is the story of injustice and the ethics of how you approach uh, and tell a story of epic injustice. And where you start with it is trying to practice a story of small injustices. I started at City Reporting in uh, Delhi and in Bhopal uh, a decade after the gas tragedy, which was like Chernobyl. It wiped out uh, half the city with cyanide poisoning. So you start small. It always starts for me, at least in Indian newsrooms, it starts at Metro Reporting. And the structure, what again Alyssa was saying, no matter how chaotic it is, there is method and madness. And how you train your eyes to look at these structures, like if you land in a refugee camp, how you get the intuition to who to go to and ask questions comes from being in a city hospital or being in a town hall or in a courtroom in your country. And then you decide which conflict is, again, this is a very crass way of putting it, in, but I'm being uh, facetious. Whichever conflict speaks to your particular dysfunction, say I started with Kashmir, uh, and uh, Kashmir has a completely different uh, heartache, which is completely different from, say, Palestine. It's settler colonialism, but completely different, which is very different from Tibet. Uh, and the government in exile is run from not very far from where I grew up, actually. Once you know where you're headed, say, if you're in a newsroom and you say in five years you want to be foreign reporting, start reading about it. And once if you want to do it solo, uh, reach out to reach out to or build the networks that you can do solo. I would not recommend starting out solo. It's scary. Um, uh, just like scary in ways you cannot predict. I remember the first year I went into Bangladeshi camps. My GPS wouldn't work inside the camp, and there was a landslide because tropical monsoon, and it's the Bay of Bengal, so it was cyclone season. And the GPS would not work and being lost inside the camp. Uh, at, e at five, everyone leaves the camps because it becomes completely, uh, it's run by criminals by evening, people who escaped from Rakhine. And there are terrorist groups uh, uh, recruiting people there. So you cannot, one thing is to be reckless but smart. And the other thing is to be, reckless but filled with blind spots and the second thing can harm you in ways that you don't know all right well i'll, I'll talk about a different pathway um and and I, I was not as courageous as vidya um and i was always uh someone who was a little nervous about doing things on my own um so i knew i wanted to go overseas but it <laughs> took me a very long time to get there and for me i i my first newspaper work was in what to me was a foreign country um which was kansas because i came from new york and uh and for me i i loved i ended up loving kansas but i really i didn't know how to drive a car when i got there i had never um eaten fast food been to a mall i, I was really pretty illiterate um 
as to what America was like coming from New York City. But when I went, decided I really wanted to go overseas and began to work towards that, I finally got to a place that had overseas correspondence. And then I went on a sort of test trip to see both how I liked it, but also how they liked me. And I was sent to help out in the refugee camps in the war in uh, Kosovo in, in um, 1999. And, um, you know, I, I guess I did well uh, enough, but uh, to be honest, I think what I did best was that I helped find safe housing for everyone. Um, my stories were just okay, which is might be what pretty much what you'd expect. I was just feeling my way. But I realized that we would need a place to live. And I um, negotiated for when the NATO invasion happened. And I, um, I, I turned out to be fairly good at negotiating real estate in foreign places. I went on to do it in several other places. Um, but it, it was certainly not what I would have wanted to be recognized for at the time. And, um, but I was still really learning how to write and report in, in places like that were um, so foreign to me. Um, so I think those are two different routes. Another route is to, to be more confident and push your way into foreign reporting much more quickly. Uh, ultimately, I was then hired at the New York Times into, uh, into a foreign desk job. So I went from the Los Angeles Times directly into a foreign desk job. They didn't want me, they wanted me to go to Baghdad where I didn't particularly want to go because I'd already been there. But I went. So that's a partial answer, maybe. Are there other, other thoughts, questions? Does, how many of you want to go into uh, foreign reporting? Like nice it's good you don't have to be certain yeah uh, how many of you have experience with the newsroom nice nice uh, do you guys have uh, uh, if you're not going to ask questions i'm going to start lo lobbing questions at Alyssa. Um, now, do you have a question claire your hand is still up no, I honestly forgot to lower it. Oh, I mean, quite I, all right. I, I have too. a question um, that I was meaning to tie into my last one. You guys okay. Mentioned, um, and it was about protecting yourself when you go into these situations and when you're doing this work, um, like when you're entering these spaces with such intense human rights issues and um, are bearing witness to all of that. How do you protect yourself in this work? Alyssa. They okay. are right. Uh, well, do you mean how do you protect yourself physically or how do you protect yourself emotionally? They're different. I, I meant more mentally, emotionally. How do you, um, you know, there's journalism is very difficult in like keeping that boundary between being mm -hmm. like, like you guys were saying, very caring and invested in this work um, and not letting it kind of eat you up when it's yeah. so intense. Um, I think this answer goes for wherever you're reporting. I think if you were reporting on um, the Black Lives Matter protests and um, confrontations with the police, this would go as well. I, I, I don't know if this is the best way to do it, but what I do is that I try to um, put aside all of my emotional responses. I, I usually want to help people. If you certainly, if you see someone um, who is a victim of a, of a, of a bombing, or you um, see someone being beaten by the police, your um, desire and instinct is to be helpful and supportive and to do something. And that is not your job as a journalist. Your job is something that no one else is going to do, or not no one else, but only a few other people. And that is to try to tell the story in a way that makes clear what, as Vidya was saying, the injustice was. And what the reasons were on the, the reasons on all sides, because Certainly in the situations of war, there are reasons on both sides and it's often very murky who is right. But um, it is 
of paramount importance to get down what is actually happening, what people are actually saying, and to think about the story and the reader. And so I literally, I sometimes will cry by myself a week after a bombing because yeah. I know I didn't, I wasn't able to do something. But the fact is, it's really unlikely I could have saved anyone. I mean, yeah. that's a whole nother question is when you come to a situation where you're given a choice between reporting and saving someone. And that's a different moral dilemma. But I just mean, if you're there and you see someone who's upset or bleeding, you, you can't take them home. You can't. But, but what you can do is use what they say to you well in a story to make other people try to do something. People actually with power, which you don't have. Your power is your pen yeah. or your camera if you're a photographer or, or video videographer sorry go ahead i sound very cold i hope i don't no, no, you, uh, in fact i wish someone had told me uh that before i got started it took me so long to learn to calm myself when something like that happens while you're on the field but the truth is i'm useless if i'm also a part of the problem right. in a place exactly. where there are so many problems uh when ostensibly i'm getting there to tell a story and then uh, just having my own uh, drama added to what's going on. Uh, the thing is, this is again why I go back to how you hone your skills as a beat reporter in a newsroom before you go into foreign reporters. I uh, grew up reporting on bomb blast in uh, Delhi and in Mumbai. Uh, and one of the things that did that for me was I knew by the time I got to Kashmir or uh, Bangladesh, I knew what I had to do to uh, keep my head above the water while I am reporting. And then when I go back to the newsroom, I have uh, on my own time, I deal with my own crisis in whichever way, it just comes out in unexpected ways. But again, a lot of it is just adulting <laughs> while, uh, things are just completely going sideways. I, I'm. It's not very specific, but you learn from the what what you do uh, while reporting uh, in a camp or in a conflict zone is just distilled down version of what your reflexes are in your regular life. Is my experience of it. Um, I leave it. I will leave it there. I I see. Uh, Tanasia, I think was had her your hand up. Yeah. It's I'm tenacious. sorry. If I'm I'm sorry, Tanisha. Thank you. My question was, what is the most report, um, rewarding part of being an international reporting? Because I find it to be probably more interesting just to be across the countries and stuff. So I just wanted to hear a little bit about, you know, how is it reporting in different countries and your experience and favorite part? I can take this one first. It's, it's why I, I love to travel the world. It, uh, it, changed my life. I feel like travel is some the only antidote for xenophobia. And I don't have money. So I con editors into sending me to places I want to go. Uh, that's how it began. But the most rewarding part of the most rewarding part of foreign correspondence for me has been learning that in the darkest of places, you find people who are the most helpful. I, uh, and they have the biggest hearts and they are open with, I remember having this lunch inside the camp after, like I, I used to take an apple with me to the camps. You can't pull out your apple from your bag and eat your apple while the, there are children starving around you, staring at your apple. So I would just like my first trip to Bangladesh, my only memory is being hungry. And you know, uh, and I did this story about how, uh, like there is Doctors Without Borders, there's something called Clowns Without Borders. And the clowns came to the camp one time. And I had never seen uh, children happy in the camps. And it's, it's, I wrote a whole story about how, what the sound of 500 happy, clapping, cheering children looks like in a post-genocide uh, refugee camp. And it's one of the stories I'm very proud of. And finding that kind of joy like believing there is good in the world in the face of all that you see has to be my biggest learning from having done that. What about you, Alyssa? 
Um, yeah, I think that I, certainly, you know, I, I, I feel very similarly. I, I'm really curious. I mean, in many ways, I feel like I'm about five years old. And the thing about, um, you know, where you say, why is the sky blue? Why is it raining now? When will it stop raining? <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like one of the great things about reporting in general is that it allows you to ask a thousand questions. And, um, and when you get to go to another country, you really understand your own, both your limitations and your privilege. And nothing brings it home as much as going to other places. And those places can be very civilized places. Um, I, I live in France, usually. It's far more civilized in many ways than the United States. It's very beautiful. It, um, even in a, in a poor village, you'll find an incredible bakery, um, uh, you know, but I learn something from Iraq every time I go there. And I have met people of conscience and deep, deep sort of kindness and willingness to try against extraordinary odds. I once met a man, this is in France, he was a mayor of a very small village that was losing population in a rural area. And his biggest problem was that there were these sort of scavengers who would come and they would force say, people to sell, not their houses, they would say, we'll take the inside. And they would take the walls, the old wooden walls, any fixtures, floors, all of them from the 18th, 19th, 17th, 18th, 19th century. So the house would be stripped. It was like the house had been robbed of its soul. And then you could never sell the house again. And so more and more people would leave. And so he was just trying to save houses so that someday young people could come back. And it was a completely uphill battle, but he wanted to save a small village and its agricultural community, which had been there for hundreds of years. And that was a kind of quixotic effort that was very beautiful. So I, I, I could tell you the same kinds of things about Iraq, um, where someone who goes back to their home after their home has been devastated, ISIS has lived in it. Why in God's name would they go back? And they say, well, we've always been here. It's, you know, we're going to try again. What kind of faith? Do I have that faith? It challenges your own, it challenges you to be better. And is that a good goal? I don't know. But certainly personally, it's an inspiring goal. And it's something that if you can put it into your writing, maybe it can make people or writing or show it. In, in photographs, maybe you can make people think about how they can make their little corner of the world better. Nobody can make all of it better. Yeah. We, uh, looks like we are at time. Do we have any? Any last questions or thoughts? Or was it helpful? We weren't sure. <laughs> and always take something to eat with you. So you can eat quietly and secretly behind a tent if necessary, or in a car when you're finished. It's really important to not um, become so lightheaded you don't make good choices. Yeah. <laughs> and water. <laughs> All of that. Right. Um, this I just, oh, sorry. One, no, I wondered if, um, just to close off, if you have any recommendations for really great pieces of international reporting that, that we could read. Oh, so many. Um, we could probably put together a short list. I mean, there's, there's many. What areas, I mean, we, we happen to both be involved in covering um, wreckage, basically, um, uh, war and refugees. But are you interested in environment? Are you interested in, I mean, there's lots of reporting that isn't about war. It can be about environment. It can be about politics. Um, uh, well, I, I always, when someone asks me this, uh, I love the uh, foreign reporting that there's this one essay uh, I will send you the list. I'm going to name a book now. It's controversially named, but the book is way more than the publisher's name. It's called Has Any Has Has Anyone Here Been Raped and Speaks English? All right. 
And it's not the Bible, but it's a scripture amongst foreign reporters, but an old kind of foreign male. And it's written by Edward Burr, who was the Times corres time correspondent for the longest time. Uh, foreign reporting has changed, but it would always help to start with that book, which tells you how it was. Right. I will send you more. Uh, we'll, we'll put together a little list and yeah. send it to everyone, if that would be helpful. Yeah. Please Probably. become foreign reporters. We need more of this. Yes. <laughs> It, it's hard, but it's not impossible. And you would all be wonderful because you're interested. That's all it takes. Yeah.